Welcome to the uh, first of the breakfast seminars in the Cardiff SBNS meeting. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the sponsors, Medprin and Severn, for this session. The topic is uh, cranial closure, and we have two talks, one from my co-chair, Mr. Ravindra Nanapaneni, and the other from Dr. Drinwen Guan from China, who's going to be joining us remotely, and he's already on the line. We think each talk will be around 15 to 20 minutes, so it will give us some time for discussion. Um, cranial closure is a very important aspect of modern neurosurgery uh, in terms of methods and materials for dural closure and repair of skull bone defects. There is such a wide array of choices for both of these uh, aspects. And I'm sure the talks will enlighten us on some newer options available. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce our first speaker for the morning, Mr. Ravindra Nanapaneni, who, who is the uh, senior neurosurgeon at Cardiff. His subspecialty interests include complex spine, oncology, and skull base. I have known Ravi throughout his neurosurgical career uh, and know him as a wonderful speaker and a great intellectual. And it is legendary that one of his early career interviews was devoted to his Mensa score being nearly 200. Ravi, please. This is the first of two talks, and this is about being talking about a novel biomimetic, a scaffold for dural repair. I neither designed the product nor have any shares in the company. I was recently reading about what was the first sign of civilization, and the idea was a healed femur. In an animal, if the bone broke, the idea was that the animal would not survive. So what is successful neurosurgery? The patient surviving. So here we have a Neolithic skull with signs of repair. We have the Edwin Smith Papyrus, a five meter long scroll, which was a surgical treatise of military uh, of trauma. And there are about 48 case reports and looking at different aspects of trauma. And it deals with what happens when you have a head injury. And very clearly it's stated that once the meninges are breached, it is a hopeless case. Nothing happens. There's no much, not much point. And nothing really much changed in terms of our dealing with head injuries till the late part of the 19th century, when three things happened which made surgery as we understand it, neurosurgery as we understand it, to become possible. One was anesthesia, the ability to knock a person out and you didn't have to hold them down. The idea of antisepsis and the whole point of brain localization. With these three aspects, we could just begin to see the idea of neurosurgery developing. And things have moved on hundred years later. We very happily breached through the dura but we do know that CSF leak is a problem and it's best avoided. Depending on the, what the operation is, the incidence can vary. And in its simplest form, it will be a pseudo seal, which hopefully we can get away with, and very occasionally an overt leak, which then needs to be surgically repaired again. So why does a CSF leak happen? It's either because we didn't close it properly, as in we paid insufficient attention, or there was a gap or very occasionally if there was increased pressure inside, driving the force. So what we needed to do was something that would prevent this as a problem. 
So we have dual substitutes. We have tried various ones, autografts of different sorts, allografts we'll talk about, xenografts, which is a mainstay nowadays, and more recently, synthetic materials. We can do it in different ways. You can onlay them, you can suture them, you can underlay them. And most often, we tend to use some sort of a dual sealant. Looking at the different variety of materials that we've been using in the last 30, 40, 50 years, <clears throat> pericranium, it's available locally, that's the best. Facial lata, if you need one, anterior rectus, increases the morbidity when you start taking autologous uh, materials. There are allografts, cadaveric dura was the mainstay before. Now, from bovine to fetal skin and uh, porcine, that's, uh, you know, this horse material that's been used, different forms of collagen, really. And more recently, I would say probably in the last 10, maybe 15 years, synthetic materials. So why is it that we, and we are going to be talking about the bottom one, redura, which is polylevolactic acid. So what is it, what is the holy grail? What is it that we want as surgeons for our dural substitutes? It has to maintain its integrity. It shouldn't disintegrate really fast because the whole purpose is lost. It's got to be easy to handle. It shouldn't stick to the brain because we may need to go back into the brain. It has to have a favorable biological behavior. So the graft host interaction should be, should be such that there is not much inflammation. It should be non-toxic. It should be available in different sizes, and there's no point having a very large size for a very small hole, or very occasionally, because of the limitations of what we have been using, you may need to use multiple patches and try to join them all together and cobble up a jigsaw. Preferably suturable, it should be strong enough for that. If it's transparent, we can see underneath if a clot is developing or a problem. And well, as with everything else, if it's inexpensive. Do we ever consider what does the patient want? Well, it's got to be effective. The patient doesn't want another operation. Well, if the patient is paying for it, it has to be inexpensive. Do we really ask what is the patient's religious or ethical beliefs? There is a paper that we are presenting later on today where many a time the surgeon doesn't know what they're putting in. And we never tell our patients what we're putting in. And uh, previously our excuse was that there was no alternative. That is what it is, so why bother? But there are synthetic substitutes available, and if they meet our requirement, why don't we use them? There is so much that we talk about in terms of Jehovah's Witnesses. There is a separate form, there is a separate booklet that we give. We think so much about what that is, but we don't talk about the majority of our patients, and I believe there should be something there. So why is that? So, ethical permissibility, if we are using an animal product, we need to know where that animal comes from, what animal it is, and does a patient need to be told about it. And if you ask an increasing number of individuals, would they want this done? And the answer is no. And that comes across quite clearly in multiple papers. But this is something that we don't necessarily think about. So this was a paper published a year ago, two years ago. Over 40% of patients said that we are quite happy not to use anything, even if it were, we were to come to harm than to use an animal product. So that data is out there, but it doesn't seem to have hit our consciousness yet. It is something that we still have not acknowledged. Montgomery said, the Montgomery ruling, we must disclose all information that the patient may attach significance to, not what the surgeon may attach significance to. And a failure to disclose that information is not in anybody's best interest. So that's where this product comes in, because I think it meets our requirement. It is synthetic, it's absorbable, and it works as a scaffold. The microstructure is very similar, and we'll look at that. And it helps recruit local tissue. So what is it? It's a chemical, polylactic acid. So it's biocompatible. It's been used for 10 to 15 years with the dura, brain, spinal cord, and nerves. It's biomimetic. It has a nanofiber microstructure. So the polymer is available as a solid. 
when you put high voltage to it, it becomes into an, a fiber-like structure that will form into a sheet. So that's the microstructure of Dura versus Redura. They look very similar. It's a beautiful piece of, uh, uh, it's a beautiful sheet. It's very, very compatible. It doesn't feel like a thick plastic sheet. You can suture it. It has enough tensile strength. It doesn't disintegrate when you hold it, when you wet it, when you pull on it. And it's watertight right from the beginning. And when you wet it, it gets transparent. So you can see through it. It gets incorporated over a few days with other structures growing through. And it's absorbable. Over a period of time, as a strength, as other structures grow into it, it gets absorbed. The strength is maintained as the graph below shows. It doesn't stick. I've been using this for the last three, four years, and I have had occasions when I needed to go back in for various reasons, and it doesn't stick. It completely nicely peels off, and it's really good. You can onlay it, not a problem. You can suture it, and it's a very nicely suturable product. You can use it in endoscopic surgery. It's very easily conformable, comes in different sizes. And because it's synthetic, you can do whatever you want with it. So a microvascular decompression, you can suture it all up. You can glue it down with whatever else you want it to do. You can use it for expansile duroplasties uh, in the spinal cord if you needed to. So it's rapidly, it, it, it serves our purpose. It has high strength, handles well, it's absorbable. It does what it's supposed to do. It prevents a CSF leak. It doesn't stick to the structures it shouldn't stick to. Being synthetic, it's got a three to five year shelf life. And the best part is when you do a large craniectomy, for example, you just need one big large patch. Being synthetic, it is not limited by the size of the animal. So looking at our characteristics that we wanted to look at, our holy grail, it meets all our requirements. In terms of inexpensive, well, I don't know exactly how much it costs, but it doesn't seem to be any more because my hospital has approved it. That's me. Any questions? I think there's time for a couple of questions, even, and then we can leave a, a further discussion to the end when we've heard both speakers. Are there any questions at this stage to Ravi? Ravi, can I, can I kick off? Uh, do you use any other method to kind of belt and braces, like, for example, lumbar drains in Because the repair is so good, and I use a sealant on top, I have not needed to. So it wouldn't be routine practice for no. you to do that? And what's the kind of evidence for the clinical use of this in, in other countries, units? Do you, do you have I'm led to believe it's used in 60 countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you use it around the world, there are lots of papers on it. So I was a late adopter for it. I mean, it's only recently come to the UK in that sense, but it's been used abroad a lot more. So I'm, I'm sure if we take a kind of, you know, straw poll here as to what the ideal would be for various people practicing here. Does, does anyone use Redura? Alistair, what's your experience? Um, I think it, it, <laughs> the risk is certainly like an advertisement here. I think it's the most compatible um, substance that I've found. I'm not an enormous user. by the company, but I'm not. Oh, I don't sound like anything. I'm just being given the microphone. Thank I mean, you. Uh, are there any, any who, who have an experience of another substitute which they would swear by and say, that's, that's my go-to? Because you had a long list of 
substance. We used to use urogen before. And uh, it, 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 it's in fact a nightmare when you actually have so many choices. Mm. Uh, so what, what do you think is the top three, Ravi? Uh, I, I'm conscious the sponsors are listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> we used to use urogen before. The problem I found, I mean, I've always been thinking, I don't tell my patients what I'm putting in. And I've always felt that this was not right. So that's a big thing for me. And I was looking for a synthetic substitute if it was available. I mean, we have some years down the line discovered diseases in stuff that we have put in before. So this brings in a different dimension to the discussion about <clears throat> how, how much should we be telling our patients. So if you have a patient who's a vegan or a vegetarian, yeah. and there are quite a number amongst us. So w you would say this is ideal for, for... I don't have to think about it. I can sleep well. Alistair. One of the problems is that you don't always know when you're going to be Needing using it. this. And yes. so we end up with this omni-consent form that caters for every possible eventuality, which of course is, is what the lawyers uh, would like us to. Actually, the lawyers don't want us to do that. The lawyers want us to stay as we are so they can sue us. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, you know, that, that's what they pretend is the ideal. Um, but you know, probably 50% of the time you use this, you don't think you're going to need something True. at the end. So could I just ask, um, just by show of hands, how, how many of us actually think about this aspect when we are consenting and inserting material? It's a small number, two in fact, which is, uh, which is interesting. I mean, w y yes, of course, please. I've yet to have a patient decline that. Okay. So, okay. I mean, would it stand up to Montgomery? Would you state which animal? Yes. Okay. Interesting. Any other comments, questions? Rick? Well, uh, sorry for croaking. Um, I, I think it's a very important issue. And certainly, if you take the, uh, the allografts, Duragard and, and uh, similar um, products, the claim that these um, will integrate and are biological implants, mm -hmm. um, well, I'm not going to say it's false, but my experience, particularly with skull-based procedures, is that this material does not integrate. Um, and I've certainly had a couple of instances where uh, I'm sure the Juragar patches have been responsible for low-grade and then significant um, skull base infections because they don't yeah. absorb. Yeah. They just sit there, you know, basically as a foreign body. Um, and I think, that, I think this discussion is timely. Um, yeah. I think if you're going to use allografts, then in the current climate, I think you are probably going to have to get consent to use that as an implant. Yeah. Whereas I, I don't think you would have concerns about using um, synthetic and absorbable substances. Yeah. But after all, they're, they're not that much different um, in chemical terms from the absorbable sutures we use. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, well, we'll probably have another opportunity later on in the day when there's another paper being presented on, on, on this same, same line of thought. Yeah. Um, any trainees who, because, Really, the other people who put these things in and stitch them up. Uh, any comments from trainees? <laughs> okay. Um, right, let's move on then. Ravi, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, would you like to come and